In the previous video, we went over drawing lines and erasing them, and in this video, we'll be going over setting up the player, and this sprite is available for download in my Patreon for free in the description, and we'll actually be able to draw lines, and when we press play, then the player will activate its physics and we'll be able to go down the lines. And in the next video, we'll be implementing the panning as well as zooming. All right, so now that we have the basic functionality down, let's actually make our player so that we can play the game. So I'm gonna import that sprite that I made in Photoshop and you can download it down in the description. So I'm gonna make a new folder in the assets called sprites. And I'm just gonna go import my nice little character. So cute. And make sure it's on sprite 2D. And I found that I liked the max size to be 256 or 512. So we can just drag it onto the scene right now and I will show you. So right now it looks great, right? But it's too big. So let's just decrease that size a bit. So I'm gonna be putting in 0.25 for the scale on the X and Y. And then under the character, you can see it looks a little weird and we can actually change the max size and lower it to maybe 256 and it will blurry it a little bit, but that means it won't look so sharp. 128 works as well. I'm gonna keep the 128 since I like that a little bit better. All right, so now that we have that, let's go into our character. I'm gonna rename it to player. And so we have the sprite render and we wanna add in a collider, of course. So let's add in a capsule collider 2D so it can shape the sled. Well, the direction it's vertical right now, we can switch that to horizontal and we can make the Y smaller. So let's put that Y to two and you can see now it looks more like a capsule and we can adjust the position of that. Under the offset and Y, we can choose negative two. Actually negative one seems to be a little bit better and we can decrease the X by a little bit, maybe 4.5 and the Y to be 1.8. Perfect. All right, and then the other thing that we wanna add is a rigid body. So we can have physics on our character. So add a rigid body 2D. First of all, we want it to not be moving at the beginning and then we want it to be moving. So currently it's dynamic, which means it's moving. So we can actually set it to static so it won't move at the beginning. And then through a script, we can change the body type to dynamic. All right, so now we have our rigid body in our capsule collider 2D, which is awesome. We can just move this guy wherever we want as well. Let's make a player script in order to start the player. So change the rigid body to dynamic when we start the game. And so we can make a new input action for that. So we can click create an input action and call that player controls. And all we're doing here is making a simple control for the player. So let's put a player action map and our control will be called space. So whenever we press space, we will start the game and also end the game. So we can just type in space here and click save asset, then go to player controls, generate C sharp class and click apply. All right now that we have that script, let's make a player script. So right click, create C sharp script player. Let's open that up. And then in our player script, we want our reference to our rigid body. So we can say private rigid body 2D RB. And then in our awake function, we can get our reference to it. So RB equals get component rigid body 2D. And we also want to instantiate our controls so we can know when we're pressing space or not. So private player controls, player controls. In our awake, we can just say player controls equals new player controls. In our on enable, we can say player controls dot enable. On disable, we can say player controls dot disable. And the reason I chose to make another input action is so that we can have different input actions for different stuff. So one of them is more focused on the mouse and this one is more focused on the player. And then we want to subscribe to our event whenever we press the space bar. So we can say player controls dot player dot space. And then we can just say whenever we perform that action, then let's call our start game function, which we will say right now. In here, we can just say private void start game. And we want to have a Boolean to see if we are currently playing or not. So right here, we can just say private bool playing equals false. And here, whenever we start the game, we're either playing and we want to stop playing or we're not playing and we want to start playing. So we can easily switch the Boolean by saying playing equals not playing. So if it's true, it'll become false. And if it's false, it will become true. And we can say, if it's playing, then do something else, do something else. Here we can say rb.bodyType equals rigid body type 2d.dynamic. So this is when we start playing the game, we want it to start moving. And when we stop playing the game, we want it to stop moving. 
And then another thing that we want to do is return it to its original location whenever we stop playing. So let's make sure that we keep that location stored. So private vector 3 starting position. In our awake, we can just say starting position equals transform dot position. So we're just storing our current starting position. And then when we stop playing, we can just say transform dot position equals starting position. And we're also going to have to make a camera later. All right, so then in our player game object, let's add in our player script. So before we actually press play, I noticed that we're still populating the edge collider even if we have only one point. So the line renderer won't render only one point because of course a line has to have two points, but we're still passing in our array of points here and if it has one value, then it'll have an edge collider. And we don't want that because I tend to click on it when I start and I notice that when I click on it, it creates that line edge collider, but it won't actually render the line. And then the player does nothing because it's just kind of floating in midair. So we can do a quick check for that here. So we can say if current line dot count equals one, then we can erase the line. So we can say destroy line and then we can pass in our game object, but we're not actually keeping track of it. We're keeping track of everything else. So up here we can say private game object and then we can just copy this here and let's erase the game object. So back up here, we can just say private game object, current line object. All right, and now that we have our current line object, then down here we can just call destroy line and we can just pass in our current line object and we can just do an else statement here. So it will only put the edge collider if we have more than one point on our line. All right, now when we press play and we start to draw a line, and right here we're drawing a line, we press space and then our player falls down, awesome. But you can see that our player starts to stop and that's because there's too much friction on the line and we can easily change that with a physics material. So we can go into our assets and let's create a new folder and I'm just gonna call it physics. And then I'm gonna right click and create a new physics material 2D. And I'm just gonna call it line material. And so you can put physics materials onto your colliders to adjust for the friction and bounciness of the collider. So right here, we don't want any friction. So let's just place that to zero. And before we actually start to do anything, I'm just going to press play and draw a line. And so let's go to that line and let's add in our physics material. So right here under the edge collider 2D, you can see that we have a physics 2D material and we can just drag in our material. And so now when we go back to our game view and we press play, you can see that now our line writer continues to go down the line. So we're going to want to do that for every line. So if we go back to our line manager, we're going to want to take in a new physics material 2D. So right here we can just say serialize field and we can say private physics material 2D and we can just call it physics material 2D. And so we're gonna put that into the line manager in a second. And then down here on our start line game object, somewhere around here, we can say current line edge collider dot shared material. And we will just equal that to our physics material 2D. All right, and so now we just have to assign that to our line manager. So go to manager and we can assign our new physics material 2D by pressing on this little circle here and I just pressed line material. And so now when we press play, and so now when we press play, then voila, it works. All right, and then another thing that we can do is change the velocity that we want our player to travel on the line, and we can do that with a surface effector 2D. So let me show you what I mean. So let's press play, and I'm gonna draw this line, and I'm gonna go to the line, and under the line, I can add a new component called surface effector 2D, and this affects the surface, hence the name, and we have to make sure to on our collider 2D to select used by effector or else the effector won't work. And so then in our effector, we can set several stuff. We can set the speed, the speed variation, and the force scale. The speed is the speed you go along the surface. The speed variation is kind of a random increase in the speed, and that's applied to the speed as well. So if you put a positive number, there will always be a random increase in speed but if you put a negative number, it will be a random decrease in speed. And so the force is actually kind of like a scaling that's applied when the game object is trying to go at the specified speed. And so if you have it at zero, then no force is applied. And if you have it, um, it could go from zero to one. If you have it on one, then the full force is applied. However, Unity recommends to not put it at one because it can counteract the other forces being applied on the object. And so the point one is actually a default value, so we can just keep that there. And so basically the higher the force is, then the faster the game object will go in order to reach its target speed. Let's just put our speed to maybe three. And if we press play, 
then our guy will go at a faster speed than usual. It's kind of hard to see though because we don't have the panning yet, but that's something else that you can add. And so we can add the Surface Effector 2D as an optional thing. Right here we can say Surface Effector 2D Current Effector equals Current Line Object dot Add Component Surface Effector 2D. And so down here we can say Current Effector dot Speed, and we can set the speed to 2 or whatever you want. And we also have to make sure to set our edge collider to use our effector. So we can say current line edge collider dot used by effector and we can just set that to true. And so we can actually make this a value up here. So if we want to change that while we're playing the game and kind of play around with those values, then we can say effector speed and we can set that to 2 up here. And then let's just copy that and paste it here. All right, awesome. That's basically the end of the video, but I want to show you something. So right here, you notice that we used our player controls to enable them here instead of in our input manager. And that's just a quick way to have it done. But if we wanted to be conforming to good coding standards, then we ideally would want to put it in our input manager. So let's actually go through that and change this code a little bit. However, this is completely optional. So in our input manager, let's just paste in the private player controls, player controls, and I'm just gonna remove that from here. And then I can just copy the on enable and on disable, and I can just erase that. And I can also erase this one from awake. So right here on enable, we can say player controls dot enable, and on disable, we can say player controls dot disable. And in the awake, we have to say player controls equals new player controls. And then we also have to make an event so we can remove our start method here. And then here in this start method, we can make another comment, subscribe to player input. And so we can just copy that. So when we perform the action of pressing this space bar, we can call our event. So we have to have an event for that. So we can just copy the events we made up here. And instead of start draw, we can say, pressed play on press play and we can copy press play and paste it here public event press play and so now we can call on press play so down here we can say brackets if on press play does not equal null then we can say on press play and call that function so now whenever we're pressing play all we're doing is making an event and our player will have to subscribe to this event so let's get an on enable function once again and on disable probably shouldn't have deleted it, but oh well. And so here we're going to subscribe to our events. So since we don't have it static, we have to get a reference to our input manager. So here we can say private input manager, input manager. And right here, we're going to get the reference to our input manager in just a second. But in our on enable function, we can say input manager dot on press play, and then let's call our start game function. And so on disable, we have to make sure to unsubscribe to our event. Cool. Now all we have to do is in our awake function, we have to get a reference to our input manager. And so there's numerous ways we can do this. We can find the name of our game object. We can find the tag of our game object, but we have to give it a tag, of course. And another way we can do it is making the input manager a singleton. So there will be only one instance of our input manager, which wouldn't be so bad since we should only really have one instance of our input manager at all times. And so just to show you how it's done, let's go ahead and make a singleton for this class. So we can say private static, and then we can say input manager, and this is our class instance. So we can just say instance, and then we can say public static input manager instance, so this is what we'll actually be calling from the other scripts in order to get the specific instance of this input manager. And if you're wondering, a singleton is just a way to say you only have one of these scripts available at all times. So it's basically a static script um, and singleton is a design pattern. So we can just say here, when we call our instance, we can just return our instance. And so how are we actually setting this instance? Well, we can do that in our awake function. So here in our awake function, we want to do two things. We want to return our instance and we want to make sure that we already don't have another instance. So we can say here, if instance does not equal null. So if there is an instance of this input manager and 
the instance is not this one, then there's something wrong. We want to only have one instance, so let's destroy this one. Else we can just set our instance to this. So the else will run if either there isn't an instance and we need to create one, or if the instance is this one, it'll just return this instance. And so this is a easy way to make a singleton. So now we can access the script wherever we want and without needing a reference to it. So we can actually erase this here if we wanted to. And we can just say input manager dot instance and then on press play. And so whenever we call dot distance, it will go here into this function and it will get our instance, which is right here. And you can see here it's static, so we can access it from wherever we want. And so same here, we can just say input manager dot instance. And then there we go, we have our on press play. Vice versa, if you wanted to just keep it like that, and not just say dot instance every time, then we can set our reference right here. So in our awake method, we can say input manager equals input manager dot instance. So here we're just storing our dot instance, so it won't have to get that instance every time. And we're just saying here, private input manager, input manager. And we can also do that for our line manager if we wanted to. So instead of saying get component input manager, then you can say instead input manager dot instance. And so before we're actually able to play the game, you might notice that in the input manager, we're getting our singleton in our awake function. So we're setting the instance. And then in the line manager, we're also getting the instance in the awake function. And that's kind of a clash right there because what if this awake function runs before this one, then that would mean it would try to get an instance that doesn't exist and it would result in a null reference. So instead of moving the input manager instance in the line manager and player into the start function, we can actually change the script execution order. So we can go to edit and project settings and then under script execution order, we can change the order in which scripts are executed. So this is useful if we want one script to run before the other one. And so we can add scripts to run on the side in the plus button. And then we can add in a script. I wish there was a search button since this is kind of populated, but you see that our scripts are up here at the top. And so we can select the input manager and then we can also select our line manager and our player. And so the script execution order is from top to bottom. So whatever's at the top gets executed first. So first is the event system, and then is the text container, and then is the text mesh pro and etc. And then we have our input manager, which is executed before our line manager and before our player. And you can change the values of the scripts execution order on the side. So the higher the value, so the bigger the number, the later it will be executed. And so now we can just click apply and then we can finally run our game. So let's press play and I've moved the player to the top left and I'm gonna draw this big line. And when I press play, you can see that now it's gonna slide down that line. All right, and so you saw that the speed was a little slow. So in the line manager, I've changed the effector speed to 10. And so let's play the game now. And you can see that now it's much faster when it goes down. Thank you so much for watching. In the next video, I'll be going over the camera follow script as well as panning and zooming. I want to thank all my patrons for their support. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. If you're interested, the link is in the description. I offer source code, early access, as well as an exclusive Discord chat. And the source code for this project will also be in my Patreon. If you haven't already, the Discord chat is in the description. If you have any questions, you can ask there or you can just chat away. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.